I'm here with CEO of Super Eagle, Super Evil Megacorp, uh, Christian Strala, or Sega Strala, there we go, got it, <laughs> uh, to talk a little bit about Vainglory. So um, one of the questions I did want to ask you is uh, the growth of Vainglory's competitive scene uh, has been tremendous over the last year. Uh, we've seen, I think I heard the number like 3,000 teams essentially thrown around. Um, how are you all keeping up with the growth? Because, I mean, this is something that in you know, to late 2015, it was very much a grassroots mm -hmm everybody kind of working together to put on a, a league and a, in a championship. Uh, you know, how are you handling all the growth? How are you making it so that uh, grassroots teams can still kind of rise to the top in the competitive scene? So it, it's a good question. And it, it is true. The Inglorious competitive scene really has grown quite rapidly in both. Like obviously at the highest level, we've had a lot of new teams join. So just this year, we've had Fnatic here out of London that's joined, but also in the United States, big organizations like NRG, Echo Fox, Misfits, right. Rogue uh, Esports, and, 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 and so on. So we're really excited about the growth of the top level competition, competition that brings just more professionalism to the scene and frankly more fans and all that, which is great. But we're also equally, if not frankly, more excited about the growth of the grassroots scene. Because at the end of the day, we made Vainglory in the first place Right. in order to provide the touchscreen generation with the kind of experiences that we grew up with on PC, the sort of play all night with your friends style, you know, play as a team competitively all night with your friends yeah. experiences. And the fact that that is growing is, is, is great for us. And we've actually paid a lot of attention when we think about our competitive framework in general. We've paid a lot of attention to the fact that, yes, we want there to be a viable competitive structure for the top teams mm -hmm. in such a way that they can grow their audiences. And at the end of the day, these people play being very professionally. They you know, right. pay themselves salaries. They need sponsors and they all of that. And we respect that. And we work very closely with teams in order to help ensure that being is a viable business for them. But at the same time, we are really excited about the growth of the challenger scene. So the, the scene whereby... Literally any team can get together with friends and qualify in first through the game itself, right, right. but then ultimately take part in these uh, broadcasted tournaments, which are they are the community runs them. Right. But they literally they go really deep into the into the into the community, and it's actually a way that both new teams but also new talent generally bubbles up through the system. Yeah. And that to us is something that we hold very very dear to us because. Right. It's very important for us for this to be fresh and for you to feel like that you could meet two friends, play as a trio, do really well and qualify all the way up to, right. the, to the highest level. Yep. And, and in addition to that, we've also had now college level leagues, so university leagues, That's right, yeah. uh, kick off both in the United States as well as in, the, in Europe, in, in the UK. And, and again, it's another scene that we really want to nurture. And all of these things take time and we don't, really don't want to force any of these things. But mm -hmm. we're very pleased that it's growing as rapidly as it is. And, and we try to work very closely with teams as well as with our community of players in general to evolve it in such a way that the players have a lot of fun, the right. viewers have a lot of fun, the folks who do it as a job, you know, have a job doing it. <laughs> right, right. But also that you can just live the dream as a whole new amateur team. So you touched a little bit on about the, the growing of talent, not just teams. Um, on the flip side of all of all that, like being the influx of teams moving up the chain, um, you know, we saw SK Gaming like recently pick up uh, rookie jungler Tyra's, uh, and who's some people are calling like rookie of the split right now. But um, are, are you all doing anything in particular to help uh, the discovery of individual talent, not just teams? So uh, it was actually a large part of supporting the community around the the challenger tournaments. Gotcha. And it, and encouraging those tournaments to literally have hundreds of teams per region able to take part for us and for us to make sure that those matches get broadcasted and that the community has enough resources right. to broadcast them and they have sponsors and they have things so that there is kind of that that those those matches get recorded and that they can be reviewed by the by the professionals and that that way talent sort of is able to get discovered right. frankly both shoutcasting talent player talent uh, in general that, that was a, that was a big important reason for it. Awesome. We are not. Um, the next step for us would be then to try to figure out how do we actually provide deeper leaderboarding. If you like, now we've released a developer API as of the beginning of this year, so you can literally go ahead and query in through the API right. what you know how different players are doing in the game, and a lot of sites out there, websites are actually creating their own sort of power sort of 
power rankings for different <laughs> players, which also help players market themselves. Because you, yeah. you, you can just say, look, you know, look at me. I am, you know, I'm Slayer 99. Look me up in the thing, and you know, you can you can see your, your record. So, right. so, so that's you know that that that's an that's another way. But we really we actually expect even toward the end of this year to see even richer sets of independent tournaments um, come up that we're excited about supporting. So all of that we hope creates for a really sort of a really broad texture and fabric of competitive environments for all levels of players awesome. that hopefully is good for the ecosystem. So uh, the league this year, um, and there were a lot of changes that were made at the beginning, right? So uh, including roster locks, uh, I think with the, the double band system was also introduced. Um, can you discuss the reasons or a few of the main changes and why they were made? Sure. And, and I think we actually make changes all the way through. It's true oh, okay. that beginning of this season, we made some specific ones, which I'll talk about. But we actually even like we just had the team captains meeting this morning to start to talk about how should we evolve it for the summer split gotcha. uh, for the summer season, because we ultimately like we all learn along with right. each other and right. we constantly, you know, keep keep tweaking. And I think some of the some of the biggest changes was probably double band draft was probably the 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 single biggest thing. The Bangalore's hero pool has grown to be big enough right. that we felt that there is opportunity to build much further strategic depth mm -hmm. into the game by adding an extra ban phase right. as, as part of the drafting process. And that literally is only there for esports right now. It is, doesn't exist in game, although we are liking how it's looking like. How it's right. evolving in, in the game. Uh, sorry for esports. So we are we will be bringing it uh, also okay. in, into the game itself. So it's a it's a way gotcha. of the esports sort of pioneering it, and then we you know we actually gotcha. bring it into that. And so you've probably. seen a lot more heroes because of the band system, right? Yeah, Basically. that's correct. So I, yeah. I was actually just trying to look at it, and I think every single hero has been played in this tournament so far, with the exception of Rhyme, I believe. <laughs> like with the exception of one. So yeah. as far as I could tell, like I couldn't. Unless I've missed something, like I literally, I believe all of them have been played, and that I think that's a that's a you know that's a that's a pretty you know there's a I want to say a good nearly forty heroes in the game, like forty one heroes, something like that in the in the in the game. Yeah. And having all of them played is just is a is, is pretty, pretty cool, and that yeah. and that is I mean it's, it speaks to the balance of the game, but it also speaks to the fact of how the double band system sort of uh, encourages right much broader set of compositions. Yeah, yeah. and also. Okay kind of, you know, showcases those players who have a, a wider pool of, of heroes to yeah, play. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So it, it, yeah, it, it, does, it does reward those players. So double band draft was, was probably the biggest change. Nice. There, there, were, there were a whole set of smaller changes around roster locks, roster sizes, um, specific sort of um, specific uh, requirements, if you like, from, from teams that we're constantly working toward to make the ensure that player contracts and such things right. are more and more buttoned up over time because right. for us we ultimately want to make sure that players are protected and that the um the basic we are creating a healthy wholesome ecosystem for, <laughs> right, for, for right. everyone yeah and sometimes it's it's obviously harder because new organizations new things in sports is new for many folks now that we have more and more professional teams it's a good opportunity to learn from those teams and, gotcha. and try to encourage there to be more standards around just uh, how the relationships between teams and their players work in such a way as to make sure that everybody yeah. get every, you know, it works out well for, for everyone. So, I don't, aside from the double ban, I, I can't think of a change that would have been really dramatic right. for right. the you know for the from a viewer uh, perspective. But mm -hmm. we constantly do make tweaks behind the scenes that ultimately we hope that results in making the league more sustainable, more successful, ultimately in the long run. So you mentioned that there's some stuff being talked about for summer. I know it's still pretty early on. Is there anything you're thinking around or any areas that you're thinking around changing for uh, for summer? Well, uh, I, I don't know that we can talk specifics, but like sort of thematically what's important to us is we've created a structure deliberately where we want to feel like every game counts. Right. We don't like sometimes if you just create a round robin league structure, you know, you could sort of yawn halfway through because sort of quote unquote, who cares? Uh, that you know, on week four of a nine week, say round robin, can just get a little boring. So, with the weekend tournament format, we create a much more sort of it concentrates points, if you like, in the hands of fewer teams. One of the things that that can lead to is toward the end of the season, that can lead to some weird incentives right. for teams. Uh, 
whereby it might make sense to tactically play a little bit more adventurous, you know, compositions, for example, right. which you might not normally play. And, and, and we want to make sure that every game feels like it truly counts at gotcha. all times. So there, there may be tweaks around that that we want to like. We want to make sure that every team puts their best foot forward in every game. Always. Gotcha. Uh, so that, that's important. Um, and we also, um, we also constantly think about what is the right balance between right now. As you know, we have two challenge battles. We have basically, uh, depending on the season, three or four weeks of play, and then there's a challenge battle. Right. And then there's another three or four weeks of play, and then there's another challenge battle to basically allow for the bottom three of the Vainglory 8, so the top level competition the weekends, the bottom three then fight against the top three that's come up from the community. Right. And for us, that's a really great sort of way of keeping the top eight fresh and making sure that we have yeah. that interaction between the community and the, and the, and the pro players. Um, the balance of that, of how many teams and how frequently we right. swap between the top structure and the challenger structure is still something that we will be evolving throughout the rest of the year. Yeah. It's not something you see in, in other leagues that often where you see the Challenger League kind of battling United. It usually ends up being at, like, at the end of a split or something, it seems like. Um, yeah, I, I think what we've but, tried to do is we've tried to think of it less as sort of a relegation format right, right. and just instead create much more of a revolving door where yeah. where uh, where just it's sort of it's an exciting thing for teams to play and watch. And even if you do end up falling down you can literally fight your way back in in a few weeks yeah and, and i think that's that. really cool i think yeah. that's a really interesting way of handling it it's different like i said yeah. it's, I, I don't i can't think of any other leagues off the top of my head that handle it that way uh and i think it's a really interesting way of doing it because it it is it allows for the revolving door which is again yeah. people can move up and down into and get invited to different mm. uh championships i guess you'd say but it is something so. that we're likely to evolve yeah. to look at how how we can make sure that in particular i think like last season um we think overall we were really pleased with just how it grew and how the new organizations did and all that. I think we could have done a better job at, say, the storytelling around some of those challenge battles because yeah. there were some really interesting narratives yeah. that perhaps we didn't tell as well as we could have done. So we think a lot about like how do we how do we do that and what is the best way to really frame these challenge battles up as really some of the most right. interesting things for the community to watch. Gotcha. And we hope to do a better job there next. Yeah. You should finish it with a dance off right at the end. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> but, so uh, yeah, speaking of the different battles now, we this you've introduced the uh, United format now. So you've got uh, a much more like cross region based tournaments going on now. So um, can you explain uh, a little bit about how the regional regional rivalries um, have been accepted by the community like in terms of engagement or viewership or otherwise so this is new so yeah. we don't know yet but <laughs> what we do what i can say is the reason why we shifted to a format where say we unlike last year where we had purely we had championships that purely was within a region like europe or north america uh, and in, in china and korea what we are doing this year is we're both expanding the set of regions that have competitions so like last weekend we had the Southeast Asia Championships take, case, take place in Manila, mm -hmm. where we have teams from all, all over Southeast Asia. Actually, we have uh, the East Asia Championships in Tokyo next weekend. Nice. Um, and here we have the Unified Championships between the top six teams in EU and North America. Uh, the reason why we moved to this structure was actually just observing, like we always do, observing and listening to our community on what they really are excited about. And they, bar none, want to sort of the, the um, sheer level of smack talk between North America and right. Europe is such that like after Worlds, uh, in particular last year, everyone was like, why do we only see this play once a year? We want right. to see this more frequently. So we then we then looked at that and, and, and thought that, hey, you know what, there's actually an opportunity here that we can create a format which actually allows us to bring more teams because our regional championships was just eight teams and here we brought 12 teams right. here, bring, bring more teams and ultimately create an event that truly lets our community celebrate their <laughs> differences, you yeah. know, yeah. Um, as a format. So, of course, we are now into day two of this first time of doing it. And so far, it seems the community has reacted pretty well. But again, we're going to evaluate this over the next few weeks and see how it feels. Mm -hmm. We will be doing it this way this year. And then we will probably count our chickens at the end of the year and look at did that. You know, was that good? And ask the community, do, do they feel like we should continue with it? Right. We certainly feel like both in here in Europe and North America, certainly, but also in Southeast Asia and in East Asia, um, we feel like there are so many regional rivalries that people appear to 
really enjoy being able to sort of bring those into play right. at these championships and, and, and we sort of intuitively agree but we'll see how it goes and, and, and evolve that's what we always do right we, we try to learn <laughs> just, from what we just did and then do something better next time well that's good i mean it's it's a process right yeah. if you sit sit in stone it doesn't work and you continue it for a year it doesn't really help anything else so uh, it, in 2016 you, you saw a lot of established esports teams uh diving into this into to the scene uh and picking up uh, rosters basically, so like Cloud9, TSM being some of the first. Um, and then, you know, I think G2, SK, uh, also kind of following suit Team Secret as well. Uh, this year, interest in League has grown even more. Um, you've got Fnatic, Echo Fox, NRG, Rogue, Immortals, uh, and Tempo Storm, I believe. Most recently, I, it's like I'm, a I'm, glad, list, right? I'm glad you could rattle all those off. I was well, thinking, oh, I, ha- I have it written down, yeah. so it helps. <laughs> my, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, so what is it about Vainglory that has sparked team interest like that from the outside? Um, so I, we've been talking to most of these teams for a long time, mm-hmm. usually just from an advisory perspective, to be honest. Like the way we look at this is PC gaming took a good 10 years to transition from right. a format of play, which was predominantly sort of campaign single player style play to a game, to a to a market, really, where you just expect all games to be multiplayer. Like that is why you get hold of that new game because right. you want to play PvP. Um, and the reason why we made Vanguard in the first place was exactly to provide that style of play for the touchscreen generation. Now, I think, and, and and we we've thought a lot from the start about like, given that the community clearly wants to play competitively, how do we set up structures that 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 sort of set this up sustainably in a way that, mm-hmm. that creates a really fun way to, to interact with the competitive scene at every level. And there, we talked to a lot of the teams from the start just by saying, hey, how would you do this? What is a good way to do this in such right. a way that ultimately we make it fun for players, we make it worthwhile for tournament organizers, we make it worthwhile for teams right, right. and for sponsors and for everybody else. Like, how do, we, how do we think about that? So we've had a dialogue going on for a long time. And I think, whereas back when we started, it was really very much like we were trying to do something clearly very new and it was sort of the jury was out to some degree like who knows will the you know will the touchscreen generation ever want to play something like this <laughs> right, and will right, they stick right. to angry birds and you know candy crush and we just nobody knew right right but over the past year a year and a half or so we've just seen the player numbers and the viewer numbers sort of, sort of grow. grow at a really yeah. rapid pace and and the participation at every level where Sure, we're still very early, where maybe where PC competitive gaming was in 2003 or 2004. Right. But we're seeing the pace of evolution in this market happen so happen to the degree where nobody is anymore asking, a sort of, is this going to happen? Or, you know, <laughs> right, in, in right. five years' time, is this going to be a big thing? It clearly will be. Um, you know, whether, whether Vainglory is the game or not, I, some game on mobile will be an order of magnitude larger than the largest game on PC in this area. Like, it's just that, that will happen. Right. Um, and what we've done is worked really closely with teams at every level, not telling them, hey, you must feel the team, you must feel the team, but rather saying, how would you do this, right? Yeah. And I think we've built relationships on that level and try to work out how do we make sure that we can create an, uh, a system whereby the professional teams can ultimately have a really good business out of fielding main glory teams yeah. and, and setting up a structure where if, uh, if and when the, the, um, the competitive scene keeps on growing further, that the teams feel like you know, fielding up, deciding to field a Vanguard team was the best thing that we ever did. Um, so I would say maybe it's just that our willingness to work really closely with yeah. these teams and try to figure out, like here in London, we're co-hosting this tournament with Fnatic and and trying to work out how do we connect our fan base with Fnatic as much as possible while while here. Right, right. Um, so all of those types of things mm-hmm. are, are things that I think probably has attracted some of these organizations. Mm-hmm. But, but we don't take anything for granted. But just like we don't take our player growth for granted, we know we have to work very hard for it. In a similar way, we know that we have to work very hard to continue to grow the competitive scene and, and continue to make sure that our relationships with teams and our relationship with tournament, or, tournament organizers like ESL who are running this right. here all keep on moving in, in a good direction. So yeah. it's all sort of step by step by step. But we certainly expect that over the next three to five or seven years, like somebody will have grown an incredibly large um, following and viewership in this area. And we're hoping very much and working very hard every day to make us a, a, a contender right. Right. for that. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for taking some time and answering some questions. Oh, uh, thank you for having me. I appreciate yeah. it. <laughs>